Thank you, Brother Kyle. I'll tell you what, we have got some very talented individuals in our church family, don't we? Our choir, our music leaders, everybody that sings our solos. The, uh, I tell you what, it just it, it sets the tone. It, it's, it's good to be reminded of who God is, what he's done for us in such a powerful way musically. And we have some wonderful people. Do me a favor, grab your Bibles and turn over to Romans chapter 8 this morning. This morning. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble there. Morning. Uh, as we dive into God's Word. Over the past few weeks, we've been looking a little closer at what has been called the crown jewel of the Scriptures. A passage that displays such a beautiful picture of what God did on the cross for us. And how through those actions, we have been redeemed. Through those actions, we have been set free from our sinfulness. And set on a new path with a new direction for a new life. The beauty of the gospel message. And it's contained in Romans chapter 8. Paul pens a beautiful letter to the people of Rome with a who we are in Christ with a jewel in the middle of it. A chapter that really gives us the foundation of what the Christian life is all about. What the gospel message is all about. And this morning we're going to be diving into a section of text that's oftentimes misunderstood and oftentimes misused. One that basically talks about the importance of the Holy Spirit. One that talks about the function of of the Holy Spirit. See, from the moment that we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, from the moment that we hear the gospel message, we turn and repent from our sins and accept Jesus Christ into our hearts, from that moment, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside us and guides us and intercedes for us and helps us along this crazy journey called life and how to navigate the various commands that we are given, how to navigate what the Christian life looks like. And we receive that by that being breathed upon us. Over in John chapter 20, Jesus is with his disciples and he breathes the Holy Spirit onto them as a guide, some way, somebody who will help them become and helps us today become the men and women that God created and intended us to be from the very beginning. See, when God created us, he created a perfect world. He created one of unity. He created one of perfect order. And sin comes in and creates havoc, creates death, creates destruction. And we need somebody to guide us through the mess. And that's the Holy Spirit. Paul starts off in verse 26 by saying, In the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. In the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. I want to pause there for just a moment because I want us to understand what it is that he's referring to when he says, in the same way. If you remember from last week, we talked about one of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us is it helps provide a sense of hope for us as believers, pointing us to the glorious day that's to come. See, as Christians, we're living in the already and not yet. We're living in the fact that Christ has come, he has died, he was buried, he resurrected, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And they're not yet on the fact that Christ will come again. And so our lives are right in between. And the Holy Spirit gives us hope about the glorification that's coming. About the moment when we will be in the presence of God. By leading our steps, by guiding us, and sometimes by speaking for us on our behalf to the Father. What Paul is saying here is just like how the Holy Spirit gives us this hope, he is also giving us the strength to endure trials and circumstances that we will face. See, Jesus never said life with him will be good as far as you will be trial-free, struggle-free. Our lives become good, yes, but we will go through various things. And anybody that tries to give us a message otherwise is not following Scripture. Because scripture says we will suffer. We will suffer in this world because of him. 
But we need somebody to guide us through those times. There's an interesting word in this text, the word help. And what does Paul mean by that? Well, there are essentially two different types of help that you can give somebody. One is help at a distance, and one is help in the trenches. Both ways are good. Both ways are definitely needed, especially in our world today. But they're different in how they function. They're different in their purpose. And they're different in their results. Help at a distance is when you see somebody who needs something or needs somebody to walk alongside them and you orchestrate an, a resource to go and help them. Sending aid to various countries is a way to help at a distance. Sending and lifting up prayers for others around the world is help at a distance. It's good. We are called to do that. We need to do that. But that's not what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit is not helping at a distance. He is in the trenches with us, navigating and living the life. What does it mean in the trenches? In the trenches means when you see somebody who needs something and you personally go and you walk hand in hand with them, helping them to navigate, to understand, to comprehend, and to deal with the struggles that they're facing. That's why mission trips are so important. Because when you go away on a mission trip, and many of us have been on mission trips over the years, you get to be in the trenches with somebody. You go and you help somebody with their home. You help somebody teaching them the gospel. Whatever it happens to be, you are in the trenches with them. How many of you have sat at a bedside when somebody was hurting? Or when somebody was close to death? And you comforted the family. You're in the trenches. How many of you sit by the... the by having a conversation with somebody and share the gospel message with them. You're in the trenches. How many of you say, hey, you know what, one of the things I'd really love to do is I'd love for you to come to church with me because there's a message that you need to hear. You're in the trenches. You're in the trenches with those individuals. Helping them, guiding them. And the Holy Spirit is guiding you to do that. You see, they're very different from each other. And what we need to understand that Paul is talking about here is that the Holy Spirit is in the trenches with us. He's giving us the hope, but he's also helping us in the fact that he's providing the strength that we need to go through things. In other words, he's hunkering down and getting into our agony, walking the journey with us, coming alongside of us. And all throughout scriptures, we see time and time again, of how God sends the Holy Spirit to dwell among his children to guide and to comfort them through life's little struggles. Let's continue in our text. It says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. Some translations will say wordless groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, that can be a little confusing sometimes when you read that text because Paul is using some words that we don't typically use in our modern day language. Words like intercede or wordless groans. What is that? Wordless groans? Because if you groan, aren't you kind of saying something? Oh God help me here. Something? What's a wordless groan? But in all reality, what Paul is saying here is actually fairly simple. He says the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf to the Father, which literally means to be a go-between. To intercede for somebody is you are a go-between between them and something else, helping them to say the words that they can't say on their own. Helping them to do actions that they can't do on their own. Helping them to live a life that they can't do on their own. Think back to when you were in high school. Or maybe even middle school. And there's that boy or that girl that you kind of sort of liked. But you were nervous about talking to them. Because you weren't for sure how they felt. And so you would grab a buddy or a friend and say, hey, would you go talk to them and see if they're dating anybody? Or see if they have a crush on anybody? Or see, see if they like me and then come back and tell me. 
That was somebody who was interceding on your behalf. Saying, hey, this individual can't do this. They, want, they like you, but they don't want to say it out loud. And they want to find out if you do, so I'm interceding there. Or in a hospital setting, you've got these things called, these people called patient advocates who work with the hospital. They know the rules, they know the laws, they know the insides and outs in the hospital, and they know the patients. And their job is to intercede, to go to the hospital with what's best needed for the patient and to bring from the hospital what the patient needs to hear. They're an interceder. This is the kind of intercession that Paul is talking about. He says that the Holy Spirit is a go-between, between between us and the Father. And he does it specifically in when we pray. Because oftentimes we come to God and we don't know what to pray for. We come to God and we don't have the words. Or we don't have the emotions that need to go. And we sit there and just say, God, I, I, I don't even know where to begin. We sit there and we long for something to happen. We long for something to be said. But we don't have the words. Those are the wordless groans, the deep longings, the desperate longings, the passionate longings that something needs to be fixed, something needs to be helped, someone's life needs to be transformed, but they don't know how to say it. There are times in our lives when we have these deep, profound longings for God to do something to interact in some way. We don't know how or even how to pray sometimes. And the Holy Spirit does. Interceding and putting words to our deepest desires of the heart and sharing them with the Father. What does that mean for us? We don't need, we don't have to know how to pray for our prayers to be powerful. We don't have to know how to pray for our prayers to be powerful. You know, oftentimes I hear people say, well, I I can't pray in public because I don't even know what to say. Or I don't spend a whole lot of time talking to God through prayer because I just don't know what to say. Besides, he knows everything I need to say anyway. Aren't we told in Scripture that, hey, God knows everything that you are going to ask before you even ask it, so why should I even pray? But you know what Scripture also says? To come to God with everything. All of our needs. All of our desires. You know, sometimes I wonder if God doesn't wait to act until we ask. Scripture says sometimes you don't know what you need or you don't receive because you don't ask. Yes, God knows everything on our hearts. He knows every prayer request that we bring. And it doesn't matter the words that we use as long as it comes from the heart. We don't need to know how to pray in order for our prayers to be powerful. Prayers are powerful. Now, that assumes that we are actually praying, that we are actually going to God with our requests, that we are actually hitting the floor, bowing at the feet of the cross and and saying, God, take this from me. Help me in this. Holy Spirit comes and intercedes and provides words when we don't have them. Prayer is one of those things that can be and actually is very, very powerful and very effective. Let's look at verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, All things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And we know all things. That for all those who love God, all things. Notice Paul's words there. And we know. He doesn't say we're guessing. He doesn't say we're hoping. He doesn't say we're questioning. He doesn't even say we're suspecting. He's saying we know that God is at work. We know this because we've seen the evidence in our own lives. We know this because we've seen the evidence in the lives of our neighbors. We know this because we've seen it in our brothers and our sisters. 
We've seen it in this world. We've seen it time and time again throughout Scripture that God knows what is going on. He is sovereign in all things. And in all things, he works to bring the good out. Paul doesn't say in some things, in a few things, in the good times. No, in all things, he is working to bring the good out of what there is. It may not be what we think is good, but it is good for the kingdom. In all things, God is working. And sometimes he's working the most in the most difficult and horrific situations to bring out the good of people. And the ultimate demonstration of God working good in bad is look at the cross. Look at the cross. Prime example of the most horrific and difficult situation. God sending his son to die on the cross for us. Nailed to that tree. To take on our sins. God's wrath. And to set us free. Something that was meant for evil. For punishment. Crucified. Such a horrific death. But what does God do? He brings good out of it. What does he bring out of it? He brings our redemption out of it. He connects us back with himself. Something that was horrific turns out good. It's a prime example of what's going on in our lives. It's a prime example of how God works in and amongst our daily interactions, our daily struggles, our daily trials. Which means in the good times and in the bad, we know that God's with us. When you're in a situation and you can't imagine anything good coming out of it, when you're in a situation and you're worried about reactions, you're worried about life after whatever decision you got to make, when you get that phone call from the doctor that says, hey, we need to talk, no matter what the situation is, in good and in bad, when you're desperate for some relief or when you're celebrating at the top of your lungs, God is there. And he is working to pull out all the good that he can for those who love him, who are called to his purpose. For those who are in Christ, we have the hope of an re internal relationship with God because of Christ. And we have a guide who will carry us through, who will intercede on our behalf to the Father, who will provide what it is that we need. God works in the lives of his children to bring about the good and to bring them closer to him. God is in those moments with you just as much as he is in the good times. You see, in the hands of God, no bad thing is just a bad thing. No bad thing is just a bad thing. There's always something good below the surface. And I got to be honest with you, sometimes I find myself wondering, hey God, couldn't you just pull about the good without making us go through the bad? Couldn't you just look at a situation if you know what's ahead and avoid the tough and just bring about the good and the love? You know, let us enjoy life. If you're all powerful, if you're all sovereign, why can't you do that? And you know the response that comes back most often is, but how would you learn? How would you grow? How would you become the hands and the feet of my son? How, how would you go into this world and share the message that this world needs to hear so badly if all I ever gave you was excitement? Besides, your brain is finite. It only understands it. You, would, you cannot handle the infinite wisdom. I say, yeah, but God, give me the truth. Give me, give me what, what is coming. And I have that moment, and I, I watch a lot of movies, and I have that moment of a few good men 
And those of y'all that have seen this movie, you know what I'm talking about. There's a scene where Jack Nicholson hollers out, you can't handle the truth. You know, sometimes I feel like God's telling me that. You can't handle the big picture, so I'm giving you a little piece of it. And then I'll give you a little piece more. And I'll give you a little piece more. And then I'll give you a little piece more. And eventually you will be to where you can handle it. But that journey's out there. And you don't know that. But it's coming. And that's okay. Because God is not in the prevention business. He's in the rest of the redemption business. God is not in the prevention business. He is in the redemption business. Church, I believe that God never allows us as his children to go through something that he doesn't have a purpose behind. He never calls us to something that he's not going to be with us. He never allows us to go through a situation, a circumstance, a time in our life alone. Sometimes we have to look for him to be there. And sometimes he acts in ways that we least expect him to. Or through the words of somebody else. And sometimes we get a direct answer. But he will always, always have a purpose behind everything that we go through. And in everything he works to bring out the good. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to bring to the surface these things. And to help us to go to God with what we need. And at the same time, he's weaving together the various events of our lives. From the circumstances that we face to bring about the fulfillment of God's ultimate purpose for our lives. And that ultimate purpose is for us to be conformed to the image of his son. The ultimate purpose for your life is to grow in the knowledge of a relationship with God to the point where you become the hands and feet of Christ into this world. Everything we do, everything we say, every action we take, every relationship we have, every decision we make, should be, God, is this what you are calling me to? Is this what you want? And listen to the answer. See, not only does the Holy Spirit take our words to God, the Holy Spirit brings God's words to us. And we need to sit and listen sometimes. The ultimate purpose for our life is to be conformed to the image of His Son. In other words, draw nearer to God. In other words, when people see us, they shouldn't see us. They should see God. If you're standing in a conversation with somebody and they see you, then you are not representing God. Because they shouldn't see you. They should see God working through you. They should hear God's voice speaking through you. Because if they see you, then what they're going to feel is they're going to feel the sinfulness. They're going to feel the hurt. They're going to feel the betrayal. They're going to feel all of that because that's human. And if that comes out more than God's love, then we got some work to do. God's ultimate purpose is that we would be conformed to his son. We'd be set free from the sin of our lives, free from that trap, and focused on him. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus repeatedly said, do things with God in mind, not us. Paul says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. If you are in Christ, you are on a mission to his purpose. The greatest commandment we've ever been given. Love God with everything that we are. All of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, every piece of us. And love our neighbor. If we are loving God with everything, then it becomes very easy to love our neighbor. 
And when that happens, the Great Commission found over in Matthew 28 is possible, which is to go and make disciples, to go and have those conversations, to go and help others receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you this question as we close. When people see you, who do they see? If it's any answer other than God, we need to humbly come before the cross. When people see you, who do they see?